come to this. Welcome everybody to the Renewable Energy Revolution Best Practices for, project, for Projects uh, to Achieve Biodiversity Net Gain. So this is an event organized by IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And I'm Giulia Carbone, the Deputy Director of the Business and Biodiversity Program at IUCN. So quick recap of what is happening uh, today. We only have one hour, so we will don't have a lot of time for a lot of questions and discussions with the audience but please do post your comments in the chat because these comments will, we can use these comments in our final report that will be shared with the organizers. And I think they're compiling you know, into a bigger report. So if you, any comments, any issue, uh, please post it in the chat. If you have specific questions for any of the speakers, do write to me. I have put my email and I will repeat my email at the end and I'll put you in contact with any of the speakers. Uh, we will share the slides and the recording with the organizers and it's up to them on how they're going to share this with all of you because we do not have the contacts of the participants. And, um, and then as we talk and the different people will come into the session, we will post, post uh, short bios in the chat so you will see who is. So without further ado, let me just give you an overview of the agenda. We are gonna have an opening by Jar Boss, who's the global director of the UCN Business and Biodiversity Program. Then Leon Benan from the Biodiversity Consultancies is gonna give us a, an overview of biodiversity risk and opportunity associated to renewable energy. And then we are really gonna have a panel discussion with question and answer with Brandon, Howard, Ivana, Joe, Rebecca, and uh, Tris and Sarah. Um, as we go through the list, you know, you will see who is who, but um, it's gonna be quite interesting. We have different type of, you know, different players in the space of renewable energy. So you will hear a lot of different, uh, different views and different needs expressed by our participants. So I think without further ado, Jared, I'd like you to please give us uh, a, you know, initial views on uh, the challenges and opportunities related to biodiversity and renewable. Great, Over well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Julia. So happy uh, uh, to do so. And I hope we'll have uh, uh, some uh, further attendees uh, joining during, during the call. So it's a pleasure to open up this session. Um, so during these uh, high level dialogues on energy, uh, which is focusing on how to bring clean and affordable energy to those that need it. But as you will gather from the speakers lineup and their talks, um, and really from an IUCN standpoint as well, we want to ensure that this massive development and transition towards renewable uh, energy is not done at the expense of nature, but actually in achieving biodiversity net gain. And that will be the main elements we'll, we'll discuss. And as Julia said, I'm the director of the Business and Biodiversity Programme of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is a democratic union that brings together the world's most influential organizations and top experts uh, in a combined effort to conserve nature and accelerate the transition uh, to sustainable development. And so we're proud to have over 1400 members of which governments as well as NGOs and more recently indigenous people. Uh, but we also have access to more than 18,000 experts in six global commissions. And some of these experts are actually here on this call. So energy growth is directly linked to, to well-being and prosperity uh, across the globe. Meeting this growing demand for energy is a huge opportunity. But doing this in a safe and environmentally responsible manner is also a key challenge. So as energy today is by far the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions from human activities, renewable energy sources must play a critical role in reversing this, combined with measures, of course, to enhance energy efficiency as a way to limit the total energy demand and consumption. Now, the recent uh, International Energy Agency report states that to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, the annual clean energy investment worldwide will need to more than triple by 2030, which is to raise to around 4 trillion US dollars. Now the question is, does this transition potentially bring some unintended consequences? Well, it does. The potential impact on biodiversity, ecosystem services, and nature-dependent livelihoods needs to be anticipated, addressed, 
and not only to safeguard nature, but also to really avoid barriers, roadblocks and delays to this massive transition. So all the sources of renewable could contribute to the loss of biodiversity and the disruption of ecosystem services. Habitat disturbance, sorry, degradation and loss, pollution, introductions of invasive species are amongst some of the most prominent drivers for biodiversity loss and potentially associated with renewable energy developments. But the impact could be concentrated closely around the projects and for others, such as hydropower plants, the impacts will be even experienced at an entire watershed level. Now, in addition, the, according to the 2020 World Bank report, the production needs of certain minerals, and I know one of the speakers will talk about it, such as graphite, lithium or cobalt, will have to increase by nearly 500% by 2050 in order to meet that growing demand for clean energy technologies. And the report estimates that 3 billion tons of materials and uh, mineral stories and metals will need to be uh, deployed for wind, solar and the um, geothermal power, as well as the energy storage required to achieve this below 2 degrees Celsius future. So we therefore really need to find a way of addressing the climate challenge and the biodiversity cri crisis in a mutually supportive manner. So in transition to renewable energy, which both avoids harm and contributes to nature conservation, can only happen with the support of all the relevant decision makers at every stage of planning and implementation. And each of these actors have got their role to play. Governments, they need to ensure risks to nature are fully integrated in the decision making process and identified as early as possible. Insist in actions to mitigate them such as protecting undisturbed natural areas, for example, from developments. You will hear from the experts um, talking after me that most of these risks can all be avoided through early planning to ensure that wind and solar projects are placed in areas of low biodiversity sensitivity. In other words, help identify those areas where developments will not come at an unacceptable cost to nature. This will include identification of go-to areas. This means identify areas already converted or disturbed, effectively prioritizing the development areas of low biodiversity whilst being economically viable for the operators. Large-scale wind and solar developments incompatible with the objectives and conservation outcomes of the protected or conserved area should really try to be avoided as much as possible. Now, financial institutions also have their role to play. They can attach similar safeguards to their loans and project investment conditions to reinforce what governments are doing. And finally, responsible energy companies. They are and they will implement in full the mitigation hierarchy. Its rigorous application is vital for identifying and managing potential impacts on biodiversity, focus on avoidance from the start of the project, citing especially is key and that is required for delivering no net loss or net gain targets for biodiversity. In certain situations, solar and wind projects can even enhance the biodiversity situation in the landscape and then become true nature-based solutions. So business should pay more attention to upstream impacts and in particular those associated to the sourcing of raw materials used for the manufacturing of the solar and wind components but the end of life decisions are also critical, given the amount of structure that will need to be disposed and hopefully recycled. So IUCN has been very active in this field and to a certain extent, this talk is a summary of most of this excess effort over the last two years. So since 2019, IUCN has partnered with Electricité de France, Energias de Portugal, the Shell Group to promote the application of the mitigation hierarchy and best available measure to reduce biodiversity impact associated with the renewable energy, and in particular in the solar and the wind power projects. Now, this collaboration has also been supported very strongly by the Biodiversity Consultancy, and you'll hear from Leon later on, as well as BirdLife International, Fauna and Flora International, the Nature Conservancy, and Wildlife Conservation Society, all IUCN members. So this project is a true cross-sector collaborative effort. 
And the first product was the IUCN TBC guidelines on mitigating biodiversity impacts associated with solar and wind energy development. And hopefully this gives guidance to better understand and manage the biodiversity risk associated to these projects. Now we are currently designing a new two-year program of work and we would welcome additional energy companies and other actors interested in elaborating, testing and promoting these best practices for managing the impact on biodiversity associated to renewable energy sources. So to conclude, we know that there is a race to zero, which contribute to SDG 7. But our key message of this session is to ensure that this race to zero that focuses on carbon neutrality also includes nature positive and contributes to other important SDGs, such as SDG 14 and 15 that focus on land below water and life, sorry, life below water and life on land. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a good interactive sessions with our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard, for setting the scene. This is, uh, you know, it's a complex issue. And I think, your, you know, your points that renewable energy is an incredible solution and we are looking forward to an incredible um, acceleration in investments. Uh, and it's something that we all look forward to, but comes with, we have to be, you know, ready to manage the, these issues well, and also building on the, on the le lessons learned from the past. Now I'd like to invite Leon from the Biodiversity Consultancy to give us an overview of what are the, why are we putting, you know, why are we talking about risk? Because uh, he's gonna give us an overview of what are the risks. And by the way, we all, you know, some of these have been also mentioned in the very recent uh, IBES, um, UNFCCC, uh, IPCC sorry, report that is talking about the connection between biodiversity and climate change, which is what we are talking today. Leon, without further ado, please, um, Go, you know, show us some of your thoughts in terms of what are the, you know, connections between biodiversity and uh, renewable energy. Thanks very much, Julia. Let me try and share my screen. I hope that presentation is visible now. Yes, is it's it? working. Yeah. Super. So I'm just going to have a, a quick run through the different kinds of renewable energy and their associated risks, which are different in each case, and opportunities for mitigating potential impacts, and also in some cases for doing positive things for biodiversity. So we've heard very clearly from Herard that the challenge is how to ramp up renewable energy massively in the near future without major counterproductive impacts on biodiversity. And that really is an interesting challenge. So to start with bioenergy, the recent um, scientific outcome report that Julia mentioned has a nice summary of this. There's a number of climate mitigation pathways that rely on upscaling biomass production quite substantially uh, to the extent of around a 30% increase, that's 500 million hectares on current cropland. Give you an idea of the scale, the land area of India is around 330 million hectares, so it's an awful lot of area. That will undoubtedly have a very major biodiversity impact were it to go ahead at that scale, just through direct uh, loss of natural habitat or displaced loss from people moving elsewhere to, to cultivate, probably nitrogen and pesticide pollution and impacts on the soil. And given that we're struggling already to grow food to feed the world's human population, uh, it seems quite unlikely that that sort of expansion area is really realistic. However, at small scales, it seems that bioenergy crops can support restoration of very degraded areas. So potentially there's a way of using some of these places that presently aren't being used. And also in agricultural landscapes, an agroforestry type approach can benefit biodiversity. We have perennial bioenergy crops. So bioenergy is not um, all disastrous, but it will have to be quite carefully applied at a small scale. It won't be a major climate solution without biodiversity suffering substantially. Hydropower is a big source of renewable energy. It really supplies around 16% of the world's electricity, and it has an enormous theoretical potential. That's, that's 10 petawatt hours per year. Again, as a scale, the US currently uses about 4 petawatt hours per year, so there's a lot of potential energy there. But it has already had major impacts. So it affects the flow of rivers. Only around a third of long rivers currently have free flow over the whole of their length. 
dams block fish movements. There's a lot more migration of fish than we perhaps thought in uh, decades past. And fish go up and down rivers, not just the ones that go out to sea or come from sea, but ones that move in the freshwater system as well. And when that's blocked by dams, whole ecosystems can start to collapse. And the alter hydrology in many multifarious ways, flows and um, patterns of flows, have very wide ranging effects on aquatic life and the deep ecosystem services as well. Obviously, dams, uh, large dams inundate chunks of land and they for a while at least emit methane. And although we tend to think smaller dams are less of a problem, um, when you add up several small dams, it's not necessarily any better than a large one. There's long been a sense that there's good dams and bad dams, and there's plenty of guidance about how to go about building better dams. The key thing is to have basin-wide planning. So you're not just building dams in a random way on different rivers in a basin, but trying to think about how you can have the maximum benefits to the least impact. Using modern and careful infrastructure design, ensuring ecological flows, and also things like fish ladders, which are useful to have limitations. But the fact is effective mitigation for hydro can be quite challenging. It's not easy to restore the biodiversity to what it was before, and there's almost always at least some negative impacts. Location is key. It's a theme I will come back to again and again in this short talk. This is just a map looking at a couple of impacts uh, on aquatic biodiversity, basically the evaporation from large dams and methane emissions. But you can see that in different parts of the world, the impacts are much smaller or greater depending on what aquatic biodiversity is there and on the kind of dams that are being built. So where you put things really matters a great deal. Geothermal is a slightly more niche um, uh, but, uh, area of renewables with quite a lot of potential in some places. It creates the kind of impacts that any sort of footprint infrastructure does in terms of the footprint itself, access roads, lines, pipelines, and there's quite a lot of noise and light disturbance as well. And you just, uh, eco, sorry, by, with most geothermal plants, they can use quite a lot of water and they can pollute water as well. And of course, they can bring in people and have indirect impacts too. It's a very localized resource, so the options for relocating are a little bit limited. And at least in theory, you have quite a lot of space around the geothermal site, under and around the pipes, for example. So if it's being uh, put into a degraded habitat, there would be the option to enhance the habitat or to protect the existing habitat if carefully designed. I'm not aware of any examples that are out there at the moment, but that's something that could be thought about in the future. And again, location is key. So here's a study that we did a couple of years ago looking at geothermal plants that are planned or existing around the world. And the vast majority are within 10 kilometers of protected area and 60% almost are close to a key biodiversity area. So you can see that there's quite a lot of potential, at least indirect impacts, if not direct ones, for damage to be done by these existing and potential sites. And we need to find a way of, of trying to avoid that as far as possible when we have a choice of where to put them. Wind and solar have impacts that are familiar, which I'll come to in a minute, but perhaps a rather hidden impact, which was mentioned earlier also, is to do with the materials that they need, uh, including rare metals for solar panels, for turbines, and for the batteries that provide backup and will need to in future. Mines have a range of impacts, which can be quite substantial, especially if poorly managed, and they include toxic waste, but many other impacts too. Um, some mining is quite specialized. That picture shows lithium extraction, which is um, evaporative in many cases, but does impact areas of unique biodiversity quite seriously. And because of these impacts on land and the, the availability of rare metals out of know, the surface of the sea, there's quite a lot of talk now about deep ocean mining, a lot of concern that that could lead to potentially major and irreversible biodiversity impacts on very sensitive and slow repairing systems. So again, the opportunity here is to improve the environmental criteria for upscale mining and really to make a much bigger push than has been up till now for a circular economy approach where materials are used and then recycled. And just again to show you a map and you can see those dark blue areas and dark pink areas where there's a particular intensity of, of mining for critical uh, minerals yeah. for renewables, yes? You, um, the slides that haven't been moving, I we tried to oh, communicate, I'm sorry. but now that you're talking about a map, it's uh, I really need to tell you. <laughs> I apologize, I uh, looks like the screen sharing has paused. I'm really sorry about that. 
Um, can you see the map now? Now, yes. Sorry, I didn't notice it turned orange, so I'm afraid you've missed some nice maps already, but let's push on. Um, this one is showing you um, just those who are who know where biodiversity is in the world will see that there's a very strong overlap between uh, areas, biodiversity hotspots essentially, and where some of these mines are that are going to be delivering rare metals in future. So again, intrinsically a challenge to try to, to keep those impacts from becoming too serious. So wind power, there's obviously footprint issues as well, but the key thing with winds is often up in the sky because you have the problem of, of collisions for bats and for birds. And that's also with the transmission lines and that goes for actually all these different power sources. Transmission lines can be a serious problem with collisions. Um, it's quite hard to eliminate that problem, even when you're citing them in places that are less sensitive. But the concern is when you have cumulative effects with many wind farms and population impacts on particular species. That's more likely where you have birds that are migrating along a path with lots of wind in the way, wind energy in the way, or where you have species that are rare or slow breeding and things like that vulture on the right are particularly prone to both hit turbines and be impacted by them at the population level. Offshore, there's a bunch of other things that you need to worry about. Construction noise is a serious issue for marine mammals, cetaceans and others. There are vessel collisions also with marine mammals and other species. The putting the turbines in the bases can cause um, changes in currents, scouring or sedimentation changes. And there's also rather poorly understood issues around electromagnetic fields um, with the, uh, the, the evacuation cables from these sites. The good thing about wind is that the resource is fairly extensive. So it's possible often to site wind in slightly lower risk areas. And there's a trade-off here often between getting the best wind and getting the best biodiversity. So there has to be some compromise. Mitigation measures can be effective if not 100%, but they also cost. And that might include shutting down the turbines when collisions are, are imminent with birds or curtailing uh, turbines at low wind speeds to prevent collisions with bats is quite effective. And offshore, there's quite a lot of evidence now that um, the turbine bases can have quite positive reef effects, as they're called, and enhance biodiversity and indeed things like fisheries locally. And onshore, when you're putting these in what you might call the right sites, where you're uh, putting them in a degraded landscape, an industrial agricultural landscape already where the natural habitat has, has disappeared, there can be a lot of scope to enhance and uh, improve biodiversity on site. Solar is perhaps in many ways the most benign of these technologies, but it does have a large footprint. And so again, there's concerns about habitat loss, fragmentation, et cetera, especially cumulatively in a landscape with lots of, of solar. And because solar is often put in hot, dry places, the systems can be quite sensitive to disturbance as well, much more than people would imagine. And concentrated solar, which is still a minority of solar, but uh, substantial nevertheless, can use, depending on the technology that's employed, quite large amounts of water, which obviously is a problem potentially in arid areas because it can deplete groundwater and change ecological systems. And there may be some fairly minor problems with attraction to panels. We're not sure how important those are yet, but they seem to be less of a concern. And of course, once again, transmission line collisions. Even more than wind, solar resource is very extensive. So it's possible usually to find low risk locations. Indeed, of course, there's lots of potential for putting things on rooftops or in built up areas too. Um, and there's potential for enhancing habitats once again, when you're siting in degraded areas, there's plenty of space around the panels you can use for wildflower meadows, improve habitat for pollinators, rare plants, etc. Once again, location is key. And um, another, another map which just shows where um, you might get the most losses if you simply went for where the resource is greatest for wind and solar. So by changing the approach slightly and looking at where the resource is good but not perfect and where biodiversity is less at risk, you can get better results for biodiversity while still having very good results for wind and solar. And just to mention briefly, there are these emerging technologies in wind and solar, floating offshore wind, uh, unconventional wind like the picture on the right and photovoltaic or floating solar. We don't understand the impacts of these yet very well. We can predict what some of them might be. They might be lower. In some cases, they might be worse. They are yet untested. And of course, we can't really wait for these to scale up before um, trying to get other, other energies, um, renewable energies scaled up in the interim. It's quite urgent. So while uh, unconventional wind turbines might be better for birds, for example, 
it's not likely they'll go to scale in the time we need to really mitigate climate change. In summary, it seems to be possible, although certainly challenging, to have this ramping up without kind of reductive impacts on biodiversity if we do things right. Important to flag that mining is a significant hidden impact potentially if not managed properly. And then can't stress enough that siting is vital and that will require integrated landscape and seascape planning. And important side note is that mitigation for wind, even in places that seem less sensitive, may often be necessary, especially for bats. And that will have a small but significant cost in terms of the implementation and the energy outputs that needs to be anticipated. That bottom diagram just gives an overall ranking um, as I see it based on this presentation of well, the highest risks versus the greatest opportunities. And you'll see there is gradation all else being equal from bioenergy through to solar. But all these, all these um, energy sources can be useful in the right place and designed the right way. And on the right side, it's important to note when the solar in particular, which hold the most potential probably can be net positive if they enhance biodiversity while not harming it in the first place. So let me stop there. And sorry about the problem with the slides, but I hope you've seen at least half of them before I finish. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Leon. And I'm sorry, I didn't want to disturb you while you were going through. And then I realized that I should have probably disturbed you earlier. No problem. All right. Anyway, uh, I hopefully they, the organizer will also share the slides, but I think you gave us a good overview of what are the different, because every technology has a different set of potential um, pressure points on biodiversity. Um, but also, as you suggested at the end, there are also opportunities for biodiversity enhancement. But um, also what we want to discuss today is the fact that there are a lot of solutions as well in terms of you know, uh, how to address these impacts. So um, just quickly, I wanted to uh, give you an overview uh, and can you just confirm that you see the slides? Not yet. Not yet. All right, so this is, we having the usual. <sighs> Okay, all right. Okay, now probably is working. So in terms of solutions, I think what is really important is that we, um, what we have learned in the past couple of years working with, you know, the renewable energy companies, EDF, EDP and Shell in a whole group of conservation organizations that it is important to look at the entire life cycle of a project. So for really from the um, early planning, site selection and project design and project implementation. And none of the approaches and tools that we are talking about can alone provide the silver bullet and be the ultimate solution. It is really a combination of actors and solutions at different stage of the process. Um, so when we are looking at early planning, you see that we have uh, the key actors are really regional and subnational authorities, conservation NGOs. Then you have you know, national and subnational authorities. Uh, and these are really the actors that play a key role in spatial planning and sens sensitivity mapping. These activities have to come before the developer goes in on the, you know, start looking at risk and then project design and project impact assessment. And it's not just about uh, better outcomes for biodiversity, but it's also about de-risking projects. So the collaboration between policymakers that develop good spatial plans uh, with input from conservation organization looking at sensitivity mapping, and then uh, responsible developers that start looking early on at do doing risk screening and then looking at implementing the mitigation hierarchy, which has the you know, stages of avoidance, minimize, restore, and offset, is the perfect combination. Um, the asking only the developers to implement the mitigation hierarchy without having done the groundwork of doing a, a good planning and a good you know, early risk screening will not have the results, you know, optimal results. So against this background, we have invited a number of colleagues who, have, who work um, on different space, uh, starting from an energy utility, uh, Sarah, who's gonna be with us. Then we are gonna talk with TNC, BirdLife uh, and other players. We will introduce them one by one. 
and we have a set of questions for them. And, um, and hopefully through these questions, we'll give you an opportunity also to understand the complexity of the challenges, but also the availability of tools out there and how these tools can come together. So Sarah, I'd like to start with you and really um, from an energy utility perspective, what do you think about the biodiversity gain as a target? And you know, do you think a company like yours will be able to reach uh, this target? And what would, be, what would be the enabling factors to achieve this uh, in the future? Thank you, Julia. Hope you can hear me. Thank you for inviting us to be here. You, you said a lot already. So uh, I would like just to pick up on what Gerald already told, because I think it's important to set a scene here in, in, with two or three figures that give us the sense of urgency and the speed, which is, I think, a key word for what I'll be saying. And what I would like to stress here is when we are talking about the energy and in my particular case, electricity generation will need to double the size by 2050. I'm using the EIA report scenario 1.5, the net zero report that just came out. And another thing that it's really important to highlight here is that the share of renewables that today it's around 30% will need to be 70% by 2050. So, uh, and again, uh, this gives you the, the challenge that everyone is facing and uh, looking at what gives us the scenarios today, solar and wind will be the, the predominant technologies being used. Okay, and we know the biodiversity impacts, we've just partnered and <laughs> the report is out there. Uh, we need to address them clearly. Uh, from the EDP side, EDP has a, a, a net zero target by 2030. And just for you to have an, a, a clue, 70% of our renewable capacity, 70% is already renewable capacity. And the next four years, we'll be investing uh, 19 billion euros to double our installed capacity in renewables in four years. So uh, there's a lot of pressure from developers, a lot of pressure. And, and this, uh, we align this commitment with a biodiversity commitment because we believe it has to go hand in hand. But if you ask me if it, it's easy, can I achieve the net gain? I don't know. So by 2030, I will have to get there. I don't know exactly how to get there. I know that today we follow the mitigation hierarchy. A lot of governments already have that under regulatory frameworks. So we are comfortable with that. But we still don't have, it's very difficult for us to, to have a, a comfort that we are getting there. So we need, and I think that as an enabler, there's still, uh, there is still space to look for standards somehow that can uh, attest this, this goal that we are facing. We commit ourselves, but we need someone to help us attesting this. So this is one thing that I think it's still, uh, missing out there and it could give us uh, more comfort more comfort on that and then the early the early planning that you mentioned in fact i think it's very important to highlight that as a developer i can do my environmental impact assessment better or worse whatever but we are a tree in a forest and normally these these projects they go along they are several at the same time and we cannot have the overall view so there's a need of a better planning at an earlier stage. And that will help giving a, a common level playing field for companies. It could be risk. So I think that's another important thing because, again, uh, we need to learn with, with our, our experience from the past and use the technologies that can mitigate that. But we need to go so fast that sometimes that's it it can be at expense of biodiversity if we are not cautious. Right. Uh, uh, and so this is very key. And again, learning and improving the knowledge on the field. I think that's very important. And that brings collaboration, open data that I think it could help uh, if we could learn from each other in a fastest way. So having common platforms where we can learn uh, about what is going on in the field because until today, what we face sometimes is overlapping. So there are companies overlapping their area, the study areas, and yeah. not learning from each other. 
So this would be uh, again another way. So because we are so many, I'll I'll pass to the next one. Thank you. Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. But these are really important points, and some of these will be also explored in more detail by I think other colleagues. Tris, over to you. Um, Tris from BirdLife, you have been working in this space for quite some time, um, and what is your what is your perception of the trends in terms of what our regulators, developers, in, in other stakeholders understand and awareness and what are the you know some of the mechanisms to address you know improve the collaboration between these actors? Yeah, thanks, uh, Julia, and uh, hello to everyone attending today. It's great to have this opportunity to talk with you on this important topic. Um, yeah, in answer to your question, ten years ago there was still you know a lot of resistance across the sector to the idea that renewable energy could, if inappropriately cited, have a significant negative impact on birds and biodiversity. And I think today, you know responsible regulators and developers now recognize that that potential exists and that they therefore need to adhere to global best practice and to work collaboratively with experts from the conservation community. And there are now numerous processes in place that bring together stakeholders to do just that. So for example, I'm heavily involved in the CMS Energy Task Force. So back in 2014, the world's governments that are signatories to the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species, one of the principal global environmental treaties agreed to establish a multi-stakeholder task force to reconcile energy development with the conservation of migratory species. And BirdLife has been responsible for coordinating that task force on behalf of the convention. And it's been a great success. So by bringing together governments, the multilateral environmental agreements, investors, the private sector and NGOs, we're able to work collectively to find and promote solutions to this problem. So collaboration really is key, and we've come a long way in this regard. There's definitely much further to go to ensure that collaboration is at the heart of all development, but we're heading in the right direction. Thank you, Trace. Um, yeah, so Ivana, also over to you. You have been advising many you know, governments and companies on multi-use you know, multi and uh, uh, marine spatial planning. Um, what is the, you know, how do you think these tools can really help unlock the potential of renewable energy and, you know, avoid the impacts on, on nature and other type of, other type of impacts? Good, good question. Thank you very much, Julia. And first of all, it's a great pleasure to, to be here today with you this evening <laughs> in Europe. Um, okay, so marine spatial planning or maritime spatial planning um, is really meant to reconcile different priorities. So not only thinking about the energy, offshore energy, which we, of course, urgently need, but also the nature and the food security, um, among the other. So we have heard from previous speakers how important careful um, uh, offshore wind siting really is. And um, many countries has, have started off with first sectoral plans, so plans for the um, offshore renewable energy, um, for example, in Germany. However, they quickly realize that a wider and long-term perspective is needed and a process that can really bring together all these different uh, stakeholders around the same table and reconcile all these different priorities in order to minimize uh, conflicts because spaces are, are uh, used in are extensively used, especially cl closer to the coast. And then of course, there are also uh, impacts on the environment, which can be um, uh, uh, accumulated in, in combination and so on. Um, so marine spatial planning has been primarily focusing on minimizing conflicts between these, these sectors. But when it comes to the concept of ocean multi-use, um, that's something I could say a bit newer. Um, and this concept is really looking to so the ocean multi-use concept. Um, countries are, are making a slow start um, and it has been recognized, um, especially in the EU as a concept that can provide a more space efficient and more systems and holistic approach towards um, offshore development. So uh, really reconciling different priorities and looking at what are the syner synergies between different sectors or sectors and the, and the environment. Um, so there have been multiple projects in this regard, um, especially research projects, design projects uh, and so on, but also some pilots in the real environment. So one example is, is coming from 
uh, the United Project, which is EU funded research project uh, with the pilots offshore in the real environment, combining together offshore wind um, and nature uh, enhancement or rather nature uh, restoration in this case, uh, restoration of the ancient um, North Sea oyster in, um, in Belgium. And there are then similar examples in, in the Netherlands as well. Um, so on the policy and planning level, for example, the, the Netherlands obliges all new offshore wind developments to consider such uh, nature inclusive and nature positive solutions. Um, in Belgium, I think four farms are open for, for such tests. So the concept of multi-use can really provide an opportunity to approach ocean development uh, from the systems uh, holistic perspective um, and be more space efficient. Um, and then another question is um, if offshore uh, wind farms can also serve as de facto MPAs uh, with possibly a positive spillover effect benefiting also the fisheries. Um, however, countries have different opinions when it comes to this. And again, I can only say that a smart siting um, is important, which can happen as part of the marine spatial plan and really bringing all these sectors together around the same table is important in order to identify what the impacts might be, what are the potential synergies um, and how can we really work together and minimize the, the impacts or you know, jointly have also some positive impacts on, yeah. on the environment. Thank you, Ivana. This is very uh, inspiring. And, uh, you know, the idea that there are the tools there to make uh, the pos for the possibility of the different users to come together. So on this, Howard, um, you work um, for the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York. New York is really emerging as the hub of the United States for offshore wind energy. Uh, can you tell us your experience on what has been established by the New York CERDA, the New York Environmental Technical Working Group, and why, you know, how and why that has been um, successful? And what uh, were the you, issues Julie. that? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, very well. Okay, great. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having us. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society is headquartered um, out of our Bronx Zoo and New York Aquarium headquarters uh, in New York City. And um, for those that are familiar right now, um, there is considerable interest um, in our offshore space in the New York fight for wind leasing and um, future development. Um, there, there are, there's um, a great process that's been going on that Julia referred to through NYSERDA, um, which, is, which stands for New York State's uh, Economic Research and Development Authorities um, process by which they convene a regular dialogue um, in the environmental sector with um, offshore wind developers, federal and state agencies, um, interested parties um, and uh, NGOs that um, have something to contribute in this space. And we as one of those NGOs, um, you know, my specialty is on marine mammals. I've worked in the field for more than 30 years, um, you know, have been, have been studying these animals in the New York bite and elsewhere around the world that we have something to contribute to the discussions, but it can be bird, you know, they're like similar to bird life. Our colleagues from Audubon um, sit on, um, sit on the environmental technical working group. And it's actually a very participatory, a great participatory process where there's information shared about um, the, the plans in terms of um, that when there is potential leasing that's that's going to occur um, interest sorry um, in, 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 in certain activities that, um, that, that there's a shared forum and dialogue for us to um, to gather and communicate and that's led to um, discussions around best practice, around um, um, things that go into the solicitations. I apologize for the dog. I'm very sorry for that. Um, and um, the, the solicitations that go in in terms of a shared thinking among developers, agencies, NGOs, trying to work together to come up with um, shared solutions. Thank you, Howard. I'll, uh, I'll now ask Joe, I mean, you guys uh, at TNC, you have been working um, on this concept called development by design. Uh, and again, we are in this space of planning. Could you give us a little bit more of, you know, of review what it, what it is and, you know, and some examples of your work? Sure thing. And, and thanks to start, Julia, for the opportunity to be able to be here and talk today. Um, I think at its core, development by design recognizes that the development planning and permitting process is fundamentally broken. 
um, we don't think about mitigation until a project is proposed. And so right now, when it comes to reducing conflicts and mitigating impacts to biodiversity from development, we spend a disproportionate amount of our time and our energy and our funding working reactively at the site or project level. And so we need to shift that away from phases that are earlier in the planning process and at larger spatial scales. And that's especially true for renewable energy um, if we want the transition to move forward. So our work seeks to invert the process. We focus more on cumulative impacts, ways that development impacts and mitigation funds can improve conservation outcomes, but also provide development certainty by providing these blueprints that make it clear where development can go and maybe where it shouldn't go um, and well in advance of projects. We work on a diversity of footprints um, from ag energy, mining and urban, and we work on land. Although my work's focused mostly on land, the, the Conservancy has programs similar that work on land, freshwater and marine. So in some landscapes, we're playing a defensive role, but in some cases, in particularly with renewable energy, we're trying to play an offensive role. Can we identify places where development can proceed with reduced regulatory burden? I, you know, for renewable energy, the conservation community right now is really comfortable telling governments and industry where they shouldn't develop, but we need to work more cooperatively to use our data and our competing powers to ID renewable energy go areas if we wanna see the rapid transition that's needed. And that's a big focus of, of our work. Um, you, I'll stop there, I, you, I'll, I'll add one more thing. Who we work with, our partners tend to be government companies and lending institutions. And we see the role of our work to provide spatial blueprints that will help achieve the sustainable development goals, the Paris Climate Accord and um, the CBD targets. So yeah, piece of cake. I am sure it's a piece of cake. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, Trace, in, in this space of uh, de you know, design, development by design, you, uh, Bird Life has also worked on these sensitivity maps. Could you give us an example and explain a little bit about how to use, you know, how, when you have used the sensitivity map and, and what they are effectively? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, as Leon uh, said, earlier, you know, one of the great things about utilizing wind and solar for energy generation is that these are widespread resources. Much of the planet is sufficiently windy or receives sufficient solar radiation to make um, energy generation feasible. So we have ample scope to choose locations for these industries that don't adversely impact birds and other wildlife. Um, and the work that Joe and his colleagues um, do and the work uh, uh, we've done at BirdLife consistently confirms this. Um, if we plan renewable energy strategically at a landscape scale and we consider biodiversity impacts alongside technical considerations, we can drastically minimize conflict between our renewable energy goals and our conservation goals. And sensitivity maps are a critical part of this. So these are maps that identify areas that, from a wildlife perspective, are likely to be sensitive to renewable en energy infrastructure so that those areas can be avoided. Uh, and BirdLife and its national partners have helped pioneer these mapping techniques, and we work now with the energy sector around the world to ensure that these maps are developed. And you know, I'm glad to say that it's now increasingly recognized, I think, across the sector that sensitivity maps are an essential precursor to large-scale renewable energy expansion and that first step on the mitigation hierarchy that you outlined. Um, so just finally, just to add and to reiterate what you said, Julia, if there are people listening who would like to know more about sensitivity mapping, more about the work that BirdLife does on the uh, CMS Energy Task Force, then please do get in touch. Thanks. Thank you. So we see that we are already putting together a whole set of, you know, tools that have been used successfully. And, you know, so this is the good news about renewable and, you know, concepts such as go areas and planning and multi-use and sensitivity mapping. Um, but there is also another, you know, I think a, a very important concept that has been actually mentioned by Sarah at the beginning that um, because of the nature of the resource, wind and solar, um, there is often this challenge of being in a cumulative impact space. Um, so Ivana, a question for you, your experience on the cumulative impact in, uh, in the marine environment, but uh, how, how important is that and what you think how the tools that you have been talking about can also be effective in addressing that? Thanks, thanks for the, for the question. And I wish it could be simple so that it can be answered in one sentence, but it's not. 
<laughs> our speakers have already highlighted many of impacts, both positive and, and negative, um, and impacts depend on the local natural environment, local circumstances, type of the renewable energy, um, and they also need to be looked in at in the context of the whole supply chain of a project. Um, but by cumulative, it means really the incremental effects of, a, of an action um, or on resources. And um, when that, that is added to other uh, past or, or ongoing or future actions, um, basically the effects can, can increase, these accumulate. Um, so the individual actions might not have high impact, but over time, these really accum accumulate. Um, and then what I would really like to, to highlight, uh, highlight is that um, are the in-combination effects, so really with other uses, with other activities, and with ongoing natural processes that could also negatively affect uh, the, the habitats. Um, so here we're talking uh, about noise, about, um, about the impact on the ecosystem services, displacement of species, disturbance or the destruction of the habitats, both long or, or short. Um, short term. But when it comes to really in combination effects, really with other uses, we have touched upon this concept of ocean multi use. So, where really two different uh, sectors are coupled together, such as, for example, um, offshore wind and aquaculture. So, in this context, looking at what are combined effects of the two activities is, is crucial. Um, so, for example, if we're putting aquaculture within the wind farm zone, um, will that attract more birds? Because birds are then attracted to the seaweed or fish or whatever is being farmed. And um, is, there, is there then uh, more collision with offshore wind farms? Um, so yeah, those are kind of in combination effects. I think we also touched upon indirect effects. Uh, and we know that you know, many of the species are migratory um, and there are multiple in their, in their interdependences uh, in, the, in the ecosystem, especially larger in ecosystems. So displacing uh, one species here might have an impact on another species thousand, thousand miles away, basically. Um, or displacing fisheries in, in this spot may make them uh, go or fish somewhere else in a more vulnerable area. So those are really kind of indirect effects that need to be uh, looked at. Um, however, what is I think here the most important is the fact that there is no really a common agreement uh, across countries on how to assess and then understand um, how, how do we understand these impacts. So the perceptions are, are still um, quite different and there is no kind of joint, uh, joint agreement on this. Um, and studies are, are done in silos. So I think we definitely need more exchange of, um, of, of knowledge and you know, more of, of exchange of information in order to really collect uh, more planning evidence and, and advise um, future, future developments. Thank you, Ivana. This is very interesting and um, leads me also to a question to Brandon. You have been, you know, you work on the on specifically one type of pressure noise in the marine environment and from different users. What is your experience in looking at, you know, how um, offshore wind is adding to maybe already a complex situation? Um, and what is how much do we know you know how much you know how much progress has been made by science to really understand the impacts on you know marine mammals and other marine species yeah thank you thank you julia can you hear me okay yeah um it is a very complex issue um uh ocean animals and not just marine mammals but fish and turtles and other animals uh, rely on sound to do almost everything in the ocean. The physics of the environment mean that it's really important for them. And so noise put into the environment can impact animals in a variety of ways. It could cause them to move away from certain areas, avoid you know important feeding ha habitats. It can interfere with their communication. Um, kind of in the extreme, it can, it can uh, damage their hearing or, or actually cause animals to strand um, in sort of extreme cases. Most of the um, things that we know are from um, from other kinds of sources. Uh, there's been a lot a lot of focus on things like seismic surveys and sonar, but we're getting an increasing um, basis of science, especially from from a lot of the work in Europe, and increasingly um, starting to be on the the east coast of of the U.S. So part of the challenge, I think, is is um, 
addressing things like long-term um, impacts while the pace of, of the need to transition to this alternative energy you know, future is so pressing and, and important um, from, a, from a conservation perspective. So there is the challenge in the fact that we don't have imperfect, uh, we do have imperfect information about the specific kinds of impacts from things like you know, large scale pile driving or, or floating wind, wind platforms or um, wave energy devices, and we don't have all of that information. I, I really um, uh, resonated with the, some of the things that Tris said about um, mapping and about needing to have information on relatively fine spatial and temporal scales. I think some of the ways that we're trying to manage things are moving away from these like there's a noise threshold and below it it's bad and above it or below it it's fine and above it it's bad and more to something that looks at spatial and temporal interactions at ecological scales and looks at multiple species but the time and the space part of it is so important and we know that we need that kind of information so you know looking ahead to construction in Howard's area off the east coast or as things are going to really ramp up out on the west coast here which is going to look totally different some of the things that we need most to assess noise impacts don't even necessarily have to do with measuring noise impacts. It has to do with what's there and when are they there and how are they utilizing those environments so that if these effects occur, which are more likely when there's an overlap in time and space, we can, we can manage it. And we have to, and I totally agree with Joe, we have to be thinking ahead. We have to be doing some of that, not just doing the impact measurements as things happen. We need data beforehand and during um, and after. And there's, I think, some really promising um, developments in, in that regard um, from people that realize that there are risks and impacts of noise from offshore alternative energy, but they are manageable with science. We can do that responsibly. And we just need to be thoughtful and learn um, from some of the, the places where we have, I think, um, collectively been not as forward thinking as we could be um, going ahead with, with offshore alternatives. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I'll ask now a question to Rebecca from uh, Irma. You work in mining, so why are you here today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the first couple of speakers pointed to it uh, in a few comments, um, just talking about the effects, the fact that in sourcing the infrastructure for renewable energies, that most of that material actually comes from mining. And so just to explain very quickly what IRMA is, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, we're a, a voluntary certification program for large scale mining. We're based on a standard, we do certification that's based on a standard that was built through stakeholders coming together from NGOs, communities, labor, alongside mining companies and purchasing companies to basically set the standard for what responsible mining means. And then we do third party assessment against that standard. So why am I here? Well, the idea is that the renewable sector is ultimately focused on addressing the, uh, the renewable energy sector is focused on addressing the challenges of a climate stress world. And it's really imperative that the impacts of mining for the materials needed for the renewable sector don't counteract the good that they're trying to do um, by potential harm at the mine site. Because really the mine site is one of the places where impacts to biodiversity might be the greatest. When we think about renewable energy, it touches on so many different minerals, aluminum, copper, nickel, lithium has been mentioned here. And so, so many different geographies are impacted and so many different places of biodiversity are impacted. The challenge with mining that is different from renewables is that the ore body is where it is. And so you can't simply site it elsewhere. You can't decide to change where it will be. The operations have to actually happen where the ore body is. And so I'm here to talk about the um, power that the renewable energy sector has in terms of using a certification system like IRMA to understand where the materials that it's using for its infrastructure come from and to understand when the mine, how mining is done could impact water, waste, air quality, noise disturbance, alteration of landscapes, everything that's sort of been spoken of thus far, but even on a different scale and in a different way when we think about mining and the, and the disturbance that it 
can have to landscapes and watersheds. So really the reason that I'm here, I'll just sum it up, is to encourage the renewable energy sector um, to think about just as they are transforming as a sector to promote more responsible management of the work that they do and the siting of their uh, infrastructure, to think about the market leverage that they have to ask the mining sector to also improve and to include more responsible practices as it relates to society, environment, and particularly biodiversity as well. Thank you, Rebecca. This is um, very, you know, it's a good note to say, I mean, there are solutions also for the, the type of impact coming from uh, mining. Um, and of course, there is a whole issue also about, you know, recycling and reuse and circular economy. Is Irma looking into that as well now, uh, in terms of uh, the, the recycling components and how is that going to be integrated into the, into the loops? In terms of recycling, we're certainly looking at it more from um, understanding where the sourcing of materials comes from. And so if you have virgin and recycled materials coming together, how do you trace that? We're looking at it from that angle. Um, and ultimately, we're definitely thinking about recycling in the sense that it's such an important element of the green energy transition. So Irma is so focused on serving the various stakeholders um, that have come around the table, the ones that I mentioned. And we know that from civil society's perspective that a focus on recycling is so important so that we don't just continue um, extraction of materials. So we, um, I mean, we are here to improve mining and how it's done. So that's really where we're focused. But we do understand that recycling needs to be such mm -hmm. an important part of the, I would say, material solution. And just one more question for you on mining, but um, because that when we're looking at renewable energy, the site is there and it's pretty obvious to everybody where these you know, big infrastructures are. Um, do you think it would be possible to, to, um, to know where the uh, prime, you know, uh, primary materials come from you know, and have a good traceability system in place? Yes, definitely. I mean, that's what we're working at in Irma is in, I mean, traceability, I would say that um, there can, uh, uh, I speak with purchasers every day. So people, um, mm -hmm. when we say purchasers, it's those that are using mined materials. And that's one of the biggest questions is they may not have traceability all the way back to the end of their supply chain. They might not know which mines their materials come from. And so I guess what I would just want to talk about, uh, just add a little bit more is to ask for a certification system anyway to basically use the voice to say we want to source from mines that have been certified against a standard that is putting forward best practices that is representative of multi-stakeholder voices and if we ask for that then we can bring a level of transparency to the mining yeah. sector that has not yet been there and that's really what Irma seeks to do. Our audit reports are over 100 pages. They go requirement by requirement. And so on biodiversity, for example, you would be able to understand a mine vis-a-vis -vis how, um, how it protects world heritage sites, uh, biosphere reserves with IUCN key biodiversity areas. So we, there's a whole chapter on protecting biodiversity, for example, among the 26 chapters in Irma that allows renewables, re the renewable energy sector to really understand the impact that its sourcing could have on biodiversity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So we have seven minutes left. I just want to check, Howard, your, your dog is okay? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, he's fine. He's fine. I'm <laughs> sorry for that. So if, um, yeah, it's, it's, First time that this actually happened in this situation, but oh, I worry, apologize. Worry, so, but I hope you got the gist of the eTwig has a great website that has all the various resources. So I, I presume Ella or Julia can share that with. We will put all the, all the links to the resources in the in the report so that everybody can actually also learn more about uh, the different you know the the different resources you have. Uh, shared uh, one more question. One more point, Joe. You were you mentioned you know your different um, partnership and projects. Do you have any one that you want to highlight? Wow, one. Um, how about two? Uh, okay. 
so in the renewable energy space, I'll do one wind one and one solar one. Um, for, for wind energy in Kansas, the program helped build a process that identified areas that should be off limit for development and areas where development could go, but would require mitigation, including offsets, as well as a process and framework on, on how offsets should be used, where they could, how much and where they best deliver net positive outcomes. That work was part of a process that led the governor at the time, Catherine Sebelius, to declare a wind development moratorium in parts of the Flint Hills. That was about more than a decade ago, but in 2020, the governor, current governor, Laura Kelly, announced a proclamation reaffirming that the tall grass heartlands wind moratorium. Um, that area encompasses about 12, portions of 12 counties in Kansas, which is about two thirds of the remaining tall grass prairie. Um, on, on solar, uh, I'd, I'd point to work that the Conservancy has done with the Bureau of Land Management, where we map the most biologically diverse and intact places that should be off limits for development, but also helped identify some of these renewable energy go areas, about 570,000 hectares of areas that were suitable, but also be lower conflict. Um, the BLM, the ones that are responsible for permitting for renewable energy, uh, adopted the plan that's aligned with that assessment, identifies 19 solar energy go zones in six states and designates large areas that are off limits for development. So far, the, the project's totaling about 500 megawatts, enough to power over 100,000 homes has been approved in less time than um, the average permitting time. So, you know, there's benefits for conservation and there's benefits for business to, to sort of build this up planning process. And we were expanding this work out in India, Indonesia, China, Southeast Europe, parts of South America and parts of Africa. So it's exciting time and I agree with everyone. The urgency is here. We gotta yeah. get moving on this as fast as possible. Thank you, Joe. So, yeah, so on this point, I, I like to ask again, Sarah, from, you know, uh, the business perspective to give us a, a final thought on this. You know, I think everybody's very positive and and hopeful that there are solutions, but there is a point that everybody mentioned the urgency. They need to kind of, you know, the speed at which the development is going, and therefore that we need from you know the science perspective and the planning perspective be able to stay, you know, to keep up with the same pace. What would be your, you know, your your main wish? Because I know as a company you really want to do the right thing, and you said that at the beginning, but a last parting word from your side. Well, thank you, Julia, the last word. Well, when I'm, we've talked about collaboration and I think this is really a, a key, a keystone on, on this, on this pathway that we all need to achieve something. And the experience that we have has been very successful. And for that, I would highlight something that we haven't spoken yet, which is the grids as an enabler. And we have a very, very good experience here in Portugal as with a project that takes, well, it's been on board for almost 20 years, just for you to understand that this, in, in fact, it takes time, but we, we managed to set guidelines on a multi-stakeholder approach with local authorities, conservation. We were able to set guidance. Guidance were put then into regulation, uh, you know, that black spots were identified, managed, more than 700 kilometers of lines were, are already corrected so that birds will not collide. So this is, this is very important. It's very experienced that I think that we can still build on this and it's the future. It's been the past for us, but it's the future, I think, that for everyone. But another thing that I think that it's very important and linking it to the indirect impacts, it's again reminding us that there's a lot of, of uh, initiatives and good practice that we have to have, not immediately on the field when we are designing, but uh, across our act activities. Uh, and this uh, linking to IRMA, uh, how do we buy, uh, what's the link, uh, what's the, the, the value chain impact, where do we set our priorities, uh, what is the end of life when we purchase something, are we already looking to the cost of the end of life? 
So, and rem remembering everyone that these kind of practices, which are common as environmental good practices, they in fact have a purpose of reducing biodiversity loss. So this link is very important. Yeah. And what we are seeing today is new platforms being built and normally it's multi-stakeholders platforms that give us a very good uh, discussion and dialogue of everyone bring something into the table that the other sector can use on their own. And so these kind of discussions like we're having now uh, can help us a lot. And so I'm quite um, optimistic in this way, uh, but sometimes I struggle with the need of yeah. having uh, data in a proper way. So I would say the last um, keyword that I would use is good data and yeah. timely uh, that sometimes lacks and it's difficult to obtain. So for yeah. us, it's an issue. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And we know, I mean, in terms of biodiversity, you know, collecting data on land or on ocean, it's a very complex and uh, time consuming and uh, also, exactly. often also expensive. So certainly there are some some benefits from collaborations and this is where also this platform could really help um, so i'm aware of the time thank you so much for all the panelists for joining um, i will put some of the you know messages here there is my email for all who want to um, contact any of the participants you can contact me we will put together um, a summary with additional links to what you know the different pa panelists talked about, and I think we will post it also on the IUCN website. Uh, I put the link to the publication that we have issued a couple of months ago with the biodiversity consultancy and IUCN, with the support of the companies and this and our colleagues from the NGOs. Thank you so much. And today was well, it was the first day of this uh, uh, energy dialogue. So good luck for the rest of the week. And we hope that with these discussions, we have influenced a bit the conversation because this conversation was about DG7, you know, enabling basically energy access for all. But what we want is also this energy is sustainable and from a biodiversity perspective also is nature positive. So we want climate, you know, uh, to fight climate change, but also making sure that biodiversity is enhanced. So thank you very much to all my colleagues who have taken the time today to be with us today and to the participants and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.